introduce you to this mission. NASA's Mars Science Laboratory, MSL. It was launched on November 26th in 2011. Uh, this is the launch of the rocket, uh, and this just gets it uh, out of orbit and on its way to Mars. Uh, if you look at the spacecraft as it's flying to Mars, it would look like this. This is what, it's, what's called a cruise configuration. Um, and you can see it sort of has this sort of saucer-like thing right here, almost like a, like a, a flying saucer. And then this is the power supply unit which uh, is on there only to supply power to this uh, flying saucer uh, sort of apparatus. Uh, as it approaches Mars, it does not go into orbit. It actually goes directly into Mars. It's sort of like hitting a, uh, Mars with a bullet. And as it's coming towards Mars, that uh, supply power supply unit falls off, and this flying saucer part then starts to go into the Martian atmosphere. That's what this is down here. This is the heat shield. And you can see it's orienting itself so that the heat shield is down. This is a process or a phase of the mission called entry, descent, and landing. Entry of the atmosphere and then descending and landing on the, on the planet. This is it, actually descending. It's gone through that phase where it's slowed down in the atmosphere. And uh, after it's slow enough, a parachute deploys. That's this uh, right here. That's the little spacecraft uh, right there. The parachute slows it down. Uh, this is a picture of it actually in its descent phase from one of the uh, orbiters, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, and you can see then that it's tethered to the parachute. The parachute is slowing it down. The parachute's relatively small uh, compared to the weight because what happens is after it's slow enough, the parachute actually comes off and then it deploys these two things. This is a rocket that is uh, what's called a sky crane and it's tethered, as you can see, to the lander right here itself. The lander is a rover. That rover is called Curiosity. And so the sky crane basically slows this down as it approaches the surface of the planet, and it very, very gently touches it down on the surface so it doesn't break the uh, lander. And as soon as these tethers go slack, they get severed, the sky crane flies away and crashes, and this is all you have left. Everything else has now been destroyed. This then uh, starts to unfold itself. It unfolds its wheels. It puts up a mast with a camera and other instruments on it. And this is the first picture it took of itself to tell the NASA uh, uh, people at Mission Control that the spacecraft itself and the lander itself were in excellent condition, ready to go. So the question then is, what was the purpose of this mission? Why did they send it? This is an expensive mission. This isn't the kind of thing that you just sort of send up on a whim. There's got to be some reason to do that. This, by the way, is a picture of the landing site, also from the Mars uh, Reconnaissance Orbiter. That's the landing site. You can see it's dark around there because the, uh, the thrust from the sky crane basically blew away all the dust. Here is where the sky crane crashed, and here you can see the parachute and the back shell uh, where the spacecraft was. This landing site is close to its first objective. The first objective that mission planners had for it was this part of the edge of Gale Crater called Glen Elk. So that's what it first did, and its purpose then was what? Why was it there? Why was it actually on the planet? And as many of you may or may not know, primary goal, one of the primary goals of this was to, was to look for the conditions of life on the planet. That's where I want to start. I want to start the course with that question. Not is there life on, the, on Mars, but if there was life on Mars, or currently is life on Mars, how are we going to recognize it? How are we going to know that this object that you see might be alive actually is or is not alive? Now in some cases it would be easy if you're looking for certain things, uh, something for example like this, that would be straightforward. That's obviously a living creature, but that's not what we're looking for on Mars, obviously. There are no hippos there. So what is it that we're looking for? What kind of life would there be on this landscape right here? So all you see are rocks, sometimes cliffs. It's a very beautiful landscape, but there's nothing obviously living. There's no trees, there's no animals, there's no insects, nothing. So what are you looking for? What we're looking for then, of course, are microbes, things that are so small that you can't see them with the naked eye. That's the definition of a microbe, which is short for microorganism. So how then in this midst of all of these rocks and dirt and so forth, how is it that we are going to determine whether microbes exist? One thing you might want to consider is, well, let's just take a microscope up there and take a look and actually do that. That's a mission that's being planned right now, as a matter of fact. Curiosity did not have a microscope, but the idea is that we could send up a microscope and we could see something like this. We say, oh, hey, look, that looks like it's alive. So we would say, yes, there, we've discovered life on Mars. So if you were to get a picture like this, though, the question is, would you say that this is life? 
look at this. This looks like something that you might consider as an algae. This looks like something that might be something that's called a foraminiferin, which you'll study in Bio 182. All of these things look like, like they're alive, and if you look at this, you say, hey, yeah, that looks like life. Interestingly enough, if you did see this picture in reality, there is nothing here in this picture that's actually alive. Nothing in this picture is, living, is a living system. So just looking at something and saying, hey, that looks like life, is not sufficient. We're going to have to discover, do these objects have the properties of life? And that's what curiosity is looking for. It's looking for something that has the properties of life. It's also looking for the conditions uh, that are required for living systems. So what are those things? What are the properties of life and what are those conditions? If you look in your book or you look online, you go to Khan Academy or you go to one of the other websites that talk about living things, there's typically a list of anything between 5 and 12, I've seen as many as 18 different properties of living things. Those are all very useful, those are all very uh, uh, important and have been used in the past to define life, but it turns out life is very, very difficult to define. So what I want to do is think of it the way a NASA scientist has to think of it. If you're really, truly going to do this and send a mission up to Mars, how is it that you're going to recognize life using the kinds of experiments that you can send on a rocket to another planet? NASA scientists, of course, have already done this. They had to have before they actually sent these missions up. In fact, they did this all the way back in the 1970s because of the Viking missions. The Viking missions also were looking for life on Mars. We'll describe those results here later on. But this is what they've come up with. The properties of life that they are looking for, if they can find these things in a potentially living system, they're going to probably define it as being alive. Notice I say probably, not certainly. But these are the four characteristics that these NASA scientists are using. One of them is reproduction. Whatever it is that you're saying is alive should be able to reproduce itself. Not that it can be reproduced, of course. It has to be able to reproduce itself. They're also looking for evidence of this concept called homeostasis. Many of you have heard homeostasis before, and a lot of times we think of homeostasis as being nice, even, no change, sort of an equilibrium, and that's absolutely true. That's what homeostasis is, but the key to homeostasis is this term right here. Not equilibrium, but disequilibrium, non-equilibrium. And the reason for that is this. How do I know that I'm alive? How do, is it that I can tell that I'm a living system? Well, one of the ways is because I maintain homeostasis. My body temperature is 98.3 sort of the average is supposed to be 98.6, it's actually less than that. Mine traditionally is 98.3. But I'm sitting right now in a room where the temperature is 72 degrees, and yet my body temperature is 98, over 98 degrees. So I'm quite a bit hotter than my environment. That's disequilibrium, that's the concept of homeostasis. I'm maintaining my body at a constant temperature that is not in equilibrium with the surrounding environment. That's a requirement for the concept of homeostasis. So we're looking for that kind of, of property as well. We're also looking for metabolism. and Metabolism is kind of a difficult thing to define, but basically it means this. Metabolism is the mechanism, the biochemical mechanisms, by which organisms are able to control their matter and energy use. So that's really what we're going to get into, and we'll make that far more precise as we go in the course. And then the other fourth concept that the NASA scientists have come up with is the ability to adapt to its environment, and that's evolution. They're looking for that property, the ability for the organism as a population, not as a single organism, but as a population, to adapt to a changing environment. So those are the four things that the NASA scientists are basically using to define life. None of those four things are actually what curiosity is doing at this point. Viking tried to look for reproduction. Viking tried to look for metabolism, evidence of those things. Curiosity does not have that capability. Instead, what curiosity is really looking for are two things, the conditions for life. One of those things is this. Every living system that we know of, every living system that we've ever experienced, is based on a polar solvent, and in our case, the polar solvent is water. Now, I'm going to make that very clear what a polar solvent is here in just a moment. But water is apparently necessary for living systems. The other thing that curiosity is looking for are organic compounds, and those organic compounds are things you've probably heard of before, organic. What does organic mean? What does it mean to be an organic compound? That's what the next section of this lecture will actually deal with, and then we'll get into the chemistry of life in just a little bit.